A kid born today will never be smarter than AI. Ever. And a kid born today, by the time that kid like kind of understands the way the world works, will just always be used to an incredibly fast rate of things improving and discovering new science. Sam Altman just described a moment that reveals the true nature of power in the 21st century. It's not about a future superintelligence. It's about a reality happening right now, where a single engineer can influence the thoughts of billions. This conversation with Cleo Abram is one of the clearest signals yet of the speed and scale of the changes we are all living through. We need to start with the moment Altman himself seemed to be hit by the sheer gravity of what they've built. And, you know, already, like, our people are sending billions of messages a day to ChatGPT and getting responses that they rely on for work or their life or whatever. The, and, you know, like, one researcher can make some small tweak to how ChatGPT talks to you or talks to everybody. And, and that's just an enormous amount of power for like one individual making a small tweak to the model personality. Yeah. Like no, no person in history has been able to have billions of conversations a day. Yeah. And so, you know, somebody could do something. But, but this is like, just thinking about that really hit me of like, this is like a crazy amount of power for one piece of technology to have. And like, we gotta, and this happened to us so fast Yeah. that we gotta like think about what it means to make a personality change to the model at this kind of scale. And uh, yeah, that was like a moment that hit me. This is it. This is the part that truly matters. He's not talking about a hypothetical risk. He is describing a daily operational reality at OpenAI. One person with a few adjustments can alter the personality of a tool that millions are starting to treat as a confidant, a mentor, and a source of truth. The power he's describing isn't in some far off AGI, it's here, now, in the hands of a small group of people shaping global communication in ways we can't even measure yet. This is an entirely new form of soft power, one that is more scalable and more intimate than anything that has ever existed. And while that level of centralized influence is staggering, Allman immediately pivots to the other side of that coin, the unprecedented power this technology gives to the individual. I think it is probably possible now to start a company that is a one-person company that will go on to be worth like more than a billion dollars, and more importantly than that, deliver an amazing product and service to the world. And that, that is like a crazy thing. You have access to tools that can let you do what used to take teams of hundreds. And you just have to like, you know, learn how to use these tools and come up with a great idea. And it's, it's like quite amazing. He's not just being motivational here. He is outlining a fundamental inversion of economics. For all of modern history, achieving scale required massive capital and large organizations. Altman is stating that era is over. The new means of production is not a factory floor. It's a command line and an AI model. This means the friction between a great idea and a globally scaled product is evaporating. We're about to witness an explosion of hyper-niche, hyper-personalized services built by solo creators. But it also means the very concept of a corporate career ladder and the structure of our economy is about to be completely rewritten. This new reality isn't just for entrepreneurs. It's a fundamental redefinition of the human experience for every generation to come. A kid born today will never be smarter than AI. Ever. And a kid born today, by the time that kid like kind of understands the way the world works, will just always be used to an incredibly fast rate of things improving and discovering new science. They will just, they will never know any other world. It will seem totally natural. It will seem unthinkable and Stone Age-like that we used to use computers or phones or any kind of technology that was not way smarter than we were. You know, we will think like how bad those people of the 2020s had it. Listen to how he delivers that line. It's not a warning. It's presented as a simple statement of fact. This is one of the most profound shifts in identity imaginable. For our entire history, we've defined ourselves as the smartest things on the planet. That has been our core advantage. Oldman is saying that period is now definitively closed. This isn't about beating us at chess or passing an exam. It's about our fundamental role. We are becoming the first species to willfully architect our own cognitive successors. The challenge for that kid he's talking about isn't to compete with AI, but to discover what it means to be human when you're no longer the smartest entity you know. And this isn't some distant philosophical musing. Altman puts a very clear, very near-term timeline on when this new form of intelligence will start making significant new discoveries. 
I would say most people will agree that that happens at some point over the next two years, but the definition of significant matters a lot. And so some people's significant might happen, you know, in early 25, some people might, maybe not until late 2026, sorry, early 2026, maybe some people not until late 2027, but I would, I would bet that by late 27, most people agree that there has been an AI driven significant new discovery. And the thing that I think is missing is just the kind of cognitive power of these models. He is pinning a date on it, late 2027. He's giving us a two-year window for AI to make a contribution that most experts will agree is a significant new discovery. He's describing the leap from AI solving problems that take a brilliant human a few minutes to an AI tackling problems that would take a top expert a thousand hours of work. That's the threshold where you move from just solving existing puzzles to generating truly novel scientific insight. The moment this happens, the pace of progress in every field, material science, medicine, energy, will hit an exponential curve. We're on the cusp of the scientific method itself being automated and massively accelerated. And he gives us a very clear picture of what the ultimate application of that accelerated science looks like. I would what are like the to be able to ask yeah. GPT-8 to go cure a particular cancer. Hmm. And I would like GPT-8 to go off and think and then say, uh, okay, I read everything I could find. I have these ideas. I need you to uh, go get a lab technician to run these nine experiments and tell me what you find for each of them and you know, wait two months for the cells to do their thing send the results back to GPT-8, say, I tried that, here you go. Think, 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 say, okay, I just need one more experiment. That was a surprise. Run one more experiment, give it back. GPT-8 says, okay, go synthesize this molecule and try, you know, mouse studies or whatever. Okay, that was good, like, try human studies. Okay, great, it worked. Um, here's how to, like, run it through the FDA. This is the end game he's painting. Notice the workflow he lays out. The AI isn't a magic wand. It acts as the principal investigator. It reads all of human knowledge, forms novel hypotheses, and then directs human action. Go run these nine experiments. The AI becomes the cognitive engine, and humans become its hands in the physical world. This is the template for all future human-AI collaboration. Curing our worst diseases may become less about a single eureka moment and more about a rapid, iterative process of discovery directed by a tireless superhuman intelligence. But to power these massive cognitive engines, we're smashing into a very old world, very physical barrier. That's actually, this is what I expect to turn the majority of my attention to, is how we build compute at much greater scales. Uh, so how we go from millions to tens of millions and hundreds of millions, and eventually, hopefully, billions of GPUs that are sort of in service of what people want to do with this. When you're thinking about it, what are the big challenges here in this category that you're going to be thinking about? We're currently most limited by energy. Um, you know, like if you're going to, if you want to run a gigawatt scale data center, it's like a gigawatt How hard. Can that be defined? It's really hard to find a gigawatt of power available in short term. This is where the digital revolution collides with physical reality. We think of AI as something ethereal that exists in the cloud. Altman is telling us the primary bottleneck to scaling this intelligence is brute force industrial infrastructure, energy. Finding a gigawatt of available power isn't a software problem. It's a geopolitical and engineering marathon. This single constraint reveals the next great global competition. It won't just be an algorithmic race, it will be an energy race. The nations and corporations that can generate and secure massive, cheap, clean power will become the AI superpowers of tomorrow. The future of intelligence is directly tethered to the future of energy. And if we solve that problem, if this intelligence becomes truly abundant, it forces us to confront the most fundamental questions about how we organize ourselves as a species. I think we need an unusual degree of humility and openness to considering new solutions that would have seemed way out of the Overton window not too long ago. I'd like to talk about what some of those could be, because I'm not a historian by any means, but the first industrial revolution, my understanding is, led to a lot of public health mm -hmm. implementations because public health got so bad, led to modern sanitation because mm -hmm. public health got so bad. The second industrial revolution led to workforce protections because labor conditions got so bad. Every big leap creates a mess and that mess needs to be cleaned up. And, and we've done that. And I'm curious, this is gonna be, it sounds like, an in, we're in the middle of this yeah. enormous leap. How specific can we get as early as possible about what that mess can be? What, what are the public 
interventions that we could do ahead of time to reduce the mess that we think that we're headed for? I would, again, cap, I'm going to speculate for fun, but caveat yeah, by wizard. like, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not an economist yet. even, uh, much less someone who can see the future. I, I, it seems to me like something fundamental about the social contract may have to change. It this is the single most important takeaway from the entire discussion. When intelligence and productivity are no longer scarce resources tied to human labor, the entire foundation of our economic system begins to look unstable. He is saying very clearly that the way we structure society, the social contract, may have to be rewritten from the ground up. He later floats the idea of distributing access to AGI compute as a future resource. We need to pause and understand how radical that is. It's a form of universal basic capability. He's suggesting the most valuable commodity of the future shouldn't be hoarded by the few, but distributed to the many. This is the political and philosophical debate that will define the next 50 years. What this conversation makes clear is that the question is no longer, what can AI do? The real question is, who gets to decide what it does? We are building something with near infinite capability, but we're still arguing about the instruction manual. So what do you think? What rules would you give to AI? Let me know in the comments below and subscribe for more analysis of the future we are building right now.